Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a uh, National Occupational Research Agen uh, Agenda Chronic Disease Council webinar entitled The Physical Activity Health Paradox and Workers' Cardiovascular Health, an Introduction to the Concept, Evidence, Proposed Mechanisms, and Recent Examples. Uh, just a brief background on the NORA uh, CRC uh, chronic disease cross-sector, uh, also known as the cancer reproductive, cardiovascular, and uh, other chronic diseases. Uh, we basically work with many partners, including uh, NIOSH, industry, labor, trade, professional organizations, and academia to address and identify chronic disease risks in workers. Uh, trying to identify the research that's going on in this in this sphere, uh, identify uh, intervention and prevention strategies, and help uh, implement solutions with that uh, through a lot of R2P activities such as this one today. And the whole goal here is to reduce uh, occupational chronic disease. And if you want some more information on the CRC Cross-Sector Council, the website is there below, or you can just type in to Google uh, NORA CRC Council for more information. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here today to moderate this uh, very interesting webinar. It's an area that we're very interested in at the Physical Activity and Health Branch. And um, that's the program where I uh, reside at the, at the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, where I'm fortunate enough to lead the epidemiology and surveillance team. Uh, next slide, please. As with many government webinars, we'll begin with a disclaimer. So the findings and conclusions that you're going to see today uh, are those of the, of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official positions of the Centers for Disease Control uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH. Next slide, please. All right, with that, it is my, uh, it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our speakers today. So, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Nicholas Krauss is a Professor Emeritus of Epidemiology and Environmental Sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles. From 2011 to 2021, he directed the NIOSH-sponsored Southern California Education and Research Center that trains professionals in industrial medicine, occupational and environmental health nursing, industrial hygiene, occupational epi, and uh, in allied sciences. He received his medical degree and a doctoral degree in orthopedic medicine from the University of Hamburg in Germany and his Master of Public Health and a PhD in epidemiology from, the UC, uh, from UC Berkeley. His research and teaching covers a wide range of occupational health issues of particular interest for today. His international research in cardiovascular disease epidemiology has helped uncover the physical activity health paradox that describes opposing health effects of occupational and leisure time physical activity. Next up, we have Dr. Tyler Quinn. Uh, Dr. Quinn is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics within the West Virginia University School of Public Health. He has a PhD in exercise physiology from the University of Pittsburgh and focused on occupational physical activity and cardiovascular health. He completed his pre and postdoctoral training at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, where he examined the physiological impacts of physical occupational stressors on cardiovascular health. He's led several projects examining the physical activity health paradox, including descriptive studies of national data on occupational activity as well as analytic studies examining potential mechanisms underlying the paradox. Next slide, please. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Li Wei Chen. Dr. Chen is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of California, Los Angeles, Fielding School of Public Health. Dr. Chen's primary research area is cardiometabolic disease epidemiology, including the etiology and prevention of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. In particular, her research focuses on lifestyle factors such as diet and physical activity, the life course perspective of cardiometabolic diseases for women, maternal and child health, as well as health disparities in cardio cardiometabolic diseases. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our hosts to start the recordings. I look forward to interacting with folks in the Q&A session. By now, most people tuning in to a public health-oriented webinar will know that being physically active is one of the best things people can do for their health, and that this is true for everyone, regardless of age, sex, or body size. 
In 2008, the federal government, under the leadership of the Department of Health and Human Services, reviewed the state of the science around physical activity and health and established the physical activity guidelines for Americans. These were updated in 2018 in the second edition of the guidelines. The guidelines list the many health benefits of physical activity that were confirmed in the peer-reviewed literature as of 2018. Important for today's talk, prevention of cardiovascular diseases and related cardiovascular disease mortality were among the most well-established health benefits, with research dating back to the 1950s and the very establishment of the field of physical activity in public health. The guidelines make specific recommendations about the amounts of physical activity that adults need to do each week to enjoy the benefits of physical activity. The actual text is very detailed, but can be paraphrased into four main points. Number one, move more and sit less. Adults should avoid inactivity because doing any activity is better than doing no activity. Number two, for aerobic physical activity, and that's physical activity which is continuous in nature, like brisk walking, Adults should do 150 minutes or more per week of at least moderate intensity aerobic activity. For example, again, brisk walking. And vigorous intensity counts two times as much. For example, jogging or running. Number three, more aerobic activity is better. Additional health benefits can be gained by doing over 300 minutes per week. And finally, number four, muscle strengthening activities at least two times per week, focusing on all major muscle groups are also important for adults' health. So the health benefits and optimal doses of physical activity are pretty well established. But things get a little more complicated when we start to talk about the domains or the context in which physical activity can occur. Traditionally, we researcher types divide physical activity into four domains. Again, we can think of these as the context or the setting in which physical activity occurs. Leisure time physical activity is that done during discretionary time and includes exercise, which is a specific type of physical activity done with the conscious intent to improve health or fitness. Domestic activity is that done during the course of household upkeep. So think about laundry or other chores. Transportation related physical activity is that done to go from place to place. So think about walking up to the corner store for a quart of milk. And then finally, occupational activity is that done during the course of one's employment. So think about swinging a hammer or delivering food as a server in a restaurant. In 2018, the Scientific Advisory Committee for the Physical Activity Guidelines acknowledged these domains in their report to the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, stating that the majority of research on physical activity and health was based on assessments of leisure time physical activity. What we're going to hear today is that, particularly for cardiovascular disease prevention, there's emerging evidence that the health effects of occupational physical activity may not be the same as the health effects of leisure physical activity, leisure time physical activity, something that would certainly have implications for the next edition of the physical activity guidelines, likely in 2028. I look forward to some interesting presentations and hopefully some lively discussion to follow. I thank you in advance for your time. Thanks for your kind introduction. When we hear about the many benefits of physical activity, it may be difficult to even consider that physical activities performed at work may not provide those benefits or even be harmful. As you will see, the evidence appears indeed to be mixed and depends on how investigators have addressed the question. I will introduce you to the recent and emerging epidemiological evidence and what methodological differences may explain apparent inconsistencies in the literature. In May of 2018, The Guardian published this headline. I think this message gets right to the core question of today's webinar. Is OPA good or bad for your health? When I say OPA, I do not mean the gray-haired guy in the picture, but rather what he is engaged in. Occupational Physical Activity, OPA, in contrast to Leisure Time Physical Activity, LTPA. And this is the Guardian summary of what researchers call the Physical Activity Health Paradox. This news article came out after an international team under leadership of Peter Koenen published a meta-analysis pooling individual data from over 190,000 study participants of 17 prospective cohort studies 
on OPA and all cause mortality, entitled Do Physically Activity Workers Die Early? Among men, the risk of death at any time during the follow up was increased by 18% for high compared to low OPA, but reduced by 10% for women. The 18% elevated risk among men supports the physical activity health paradox. But what about women? Are the female findings consistent with the PA paradox, or is that a new gender paradox? Our answer could be no, because in women, both OPA and LTPR reduced the risk, correct? Well, not quite. The apparent protective OPA effect of 10% among women is much smaller than the 20 to 25 to 50 percent reduction reported in the literature. If high OPA were protective, it should have bigger and not smaller effects than leisure time physical activity, because OPA is exercised much longer each day than leisure time physical activity, and more protective physical activity should provide more health benefits, guidelines say, don't they? Okay, we don't want to leave women hanging here. Most studies were about men to start with, 11 out of 23 in this review. We need to interpret these results with caution. But I think this study does not provide any valid evidence that high OPA reduces health risks in women, even though this heart, heart ratio, um, hazard ratio is below one. Let me explain. First, most cohort study and also this meta-analysis categorized OPA in ways that will artificially lower any risk estimates for all study participants, but especially for women. This review and many of the underlying studies categorized continuous data or collapse different exposure groups into only two to four rather broad categories or into population quartiles. This results in a broad high OPA category that is no longer limited to those with highest actually OPA levels and may include many workers that do not perform any heavy work at all, especially among the female group. These workers will therefore dilute any health risks that are linked to high OPA exposure. The health risk in such mixed groups will be even more diluted for women than men because few of them have heavy jobs. Second, a similar and even worse mixing of OPA exposure and risk levels happens at the lower end of OPA. Neither the low OPA nor the so-called sedentary OPA reference groups have been limited to people primarily sitting at work. To the contrary, both reference groups typically include both sitting and standing workers. Consequently, our meta-analysis was unable to effectively differentiate between sitting and standing exposures either. Now, this is very problematic because prolonged standing at work has been shown to be a much stronger risk factor for cardiovascular disease than sitting. And therefore, prolonged standing at work should not be part of any low risk OPA reference group. To demonstrate this with a recent Canadian study led by Peter Smith, who shows us how big posture related risk difference is. Primarily standing at work increased the incidence of hospitalization for first time coronary heart disease and heart failure over twofold by 121%, equally for both women and men who came from a representative healthy sample of over 7,000 Ontario workers followed up for 12 years. Predominant work postures were not assessed by self-report, but objectively by human resource job requirement data. Since typically more women than men hold jobs where primary standing is either a requirement of their job tasks or mandated by their employer, for other reasons, such standing exposures will be more frequent in exposure reference groups for female workers than male workers, further reducing or completely masking any health risks in the high OPA groups 
or even falsely showing a protective effect. In, in my experience with epidemiological cohort studies of large populations, regardless of the outcome, misclassification of work exposure is usually the biggest issue, threatening the validity of results much more than lack of generalizability or residual confounding by individual worker health behaviors. Physical activities at work tend to be amazingly stable predictors of health outcomes, irrespective of adjustment for strong cardiovascular risk factors, such as smoking or alcohol or obesity or leisure time physical activity. Working people spend most of their wake time at work, so it should not actually come as a surprise that experience at work, including OPA, affect their health more than anything else they do during leisure, especially if they don't have much leisure time when their standing service jobs and their manual labor pay only low wages and often force people to hold more than one job task to, end, to make ends meet. The study of Ontario's workers is actually a good example to demonstrate the limited role of these behavioral factors. The risk of standing in this graph was adjusted for several important potential risk factors, such as education, ethnicity, immigrant status, marital status, children, diabetes, hypertension, mental disorders and other chronic conditions, shift work even, and physical job demands other than standing or work or sitting, but not for behavioral cardiovascular disease risk factors. Now imagine in your mind how the observed risk would change either up or down if the authors were to control additionally for individual health behaviors of smoking, alcohol, leisure time, physical activity, and obesity. Got it in your mind? Okay, please compare now and see what you what actually happened when they adjusted for these additional factors. Not much really. The risk of heart disease associated with primary standing at work changed from 121% to 106%. It is still more than twice as high than primarily, sit than primarily sitting at work. Of course, residual confounding can never be ruled out, but experience and logic tell us that even better control for these behavioral factors would need lead to ever smaller changes, never able to explain away this twofold risk. So here you can see the big elephant standing, pun intended, in the room of physical activity research, prolonged standing. And we haven't even talked about the healthy worker selection effect. Taking all these factors together, it's very likely that women also experience elevated risk from high OPA as men do. And some other studies, not part of this meta-analysis review, reviewed here, showed this. For future reference, here's a forest plot with individual risk estimates of the 17 cohorts. But for now, let's look at the main conclusions of the authors. They suggest that for the PA guidelines should differentiate between OPA and LTPR, and they warn that OPA may not have the same health benefits than LTPR, and that OPA may even increase health risks that could lead to premature death. Do these conclusions make sense to you? And if yes, or even if no, should this warning be part of a new physical activity guideline? Well, let's look what our government PA guidelines say about these OPA risks right now. Nothing. Nichts. Nada. Not a sentence or picture about OPA or in the entire guidelines. Okay, Kernan's review was not yet available to them at the time, but our reviewed literature was. And these studies should have been considered for an urgent update of the evidence base used by the Department of Health and Human Services to formulate its guidelines. Including this study from the 2009 landmark study that provided the first clear evidence for the physical activity paradox in men. 
the association of high leisure time physical activity with a 51% reduction of ischemic heart disease mortality was in the expected direction. But the association of OPA in the opposite direction with a 49% increased mortality risk was not expected. And that was alarming at the time because up to this point, most researchers had focused their research on leisure time physical activity or total physical activity during the entire day. By 2013, Dr. Jean Li, a member of this committee, identified 23 new large cohort studies, with eight of them investigating OPA separately from LTPA. On average, a high level of LTPA was protective, reducing overall cardiovascular disease incidence by 34%. In contrast, a high level of OPA increased incidence risk by 25%, even after adjustment for at, last, at least five of the traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors. In aggregate, the findings confirmed the existence of the PA paradox and of significant health risks of OPA. Finally, I will show you some results from the Finnish Kupio study of 1,891 working men that used state-of-the-art measures of virtually all known CVD risk factors, shown here. The, the analysis I'm going to show you have all been adjusted for these 18 covariates. In this study, we used several continuous OPA measures. Here you see increases in coronary heart disease and all-cause mortality for both healthy men and those with coronary heart disease at baseline, up to 30% for every 10% increase of relative aerobic workload, that is the energy expenditure expressed as percent of cardiorespiratory fitness assessed by bicycle ergometer for each worker. For incidence of, of cardiovascular disease, acute myocardial infarction, lower, somewhat lower, but still substantial risks were observed when we used a measure that accounted for individual objectively determined cardiorespiratory fitness again. In contrast, a measure using kilocalories based on METs and body weight only was not predictive. Clearly, the relative measures of OPA taking cardiorespiratory fitness and worker capacity into account are much more sensitive and should be performed in future cardiovascular disease research. In closing, here is a calculation of the number of extra cases per 100,000 workers each year attributable to, to OPA in this study, calculated from incidence rates and estimated relative risks you just saw. Although the relative risk among men with coronary heart disease is smaller than in men without coronary heart disease, 1.08 compared to 1.18. The number of extra first myocardial infarctions per 100,000 middle-aged workers each year is about the same magnitude for each subgroup, about 200 extra myocardial infarctions. That is because the baseline rate of myocardial infarction is much higher among those with pre-existing coronary heart disease. They are already at a higher risk that then gets further increased by high OPA. For comparisons, the cumulative OS death toll from COVID-19 has been around 400 in 100,000 in the period of three years. Sites, the, the series, what do we need to consider going forward? First, serious OPA health risks exist and need to be communicated to both men and women. Sex differentials are most likely due to unrecognized exposure differences. We need to improve exposure assessment and analytics. Use relevant BR biomarkers for cardiovascular strain and evaluate cumulative doses over the life course of these people over their career and work-centered thresholds to determine safe upper limits. More is better may be true for low levels of leisure time physical activity, 
but it's already questionable for high intensity athletic sports activity and potentially dead wrong for OPA, pun intended. Workers deserve better and safer guidelines and interventions. Why are we in public so obsessed with disrupting sitting and remain totally oblivious about the needs of standing and highly active manual workers? Who, who will be the first to propose a study that standing workers get seats and longer rest breaks for recovery from high cardiovascular strain so that workers don't fall asleep in front of their steering wheel or their TV at home, unwittingly contributing hours of their life to research that somehow manages to discount the work effects of long hours and later blame them for their fatigue and heart problems to an inactive lifestyle they could only dream about and may not even reach in retirement due to premature death. This was a polemic remark, but I think I need to wake people up. Interactions with other exposures causing cardiovascular strain who also exist in the work environment and need to be quantified and considered in occupational health practice. Scientists, in addition, need to learn how to account for risk masking healthy worker selection effects and how to avoid OPA exposure misclassification biases that mask risks and are the main source for any inconsistency in the literature. By contrast, residual confounding by individual health behaviors has been dealt with successfully, and it has been repeatedly shown to be a comparatively minor issue. It should not, should not distract from focusing on the two main tasks, reduce OPA mis uh, exposure misclassification and healthy worker selection biases. Each of these keywords on this list justify an extra webinar, but we can maybe at least touch on these points during the discussion. For now, I hope I have answered this initial, this initial question. Yes, I think it is our duty to warn the workers and the general public about this potentially fat fatal job hazard even if the scientific evidence still contains inconsistent findings and knowledge gaps. Medical ethics and the public health precautionary principle require us to warn all workers who are potentially exposed to such risks. Until there are new safer guidelines, the Guardian's headline may serve as a good enough publicly available summary of the current epidemiological evidence on the opposing health effects of physical activity chosen at leisure versus physical activities demanded at work. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tyler Quinn. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Public Health at West Virginia University. And my hope today is to provide some further context to the physical activity health paradox by discussing the proposed mechanisms that could support the associations with which Dr. Krauss just expertly outlined. As Dr. Krauss indicated already, the physical activity health paradox is really the notion that while we know leisure time and physical activity is beneficial, occupational physical activity may have null or even adverse effects on cardiovascular health. And um, we already got a great overview of the epidemiological literature in the space, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I did want to um, provide some context to data in the United States because most of the studies in epidemiological evidence thus far have utilized European and Asian cohorts. So in this 2001 paper, we examined the paradox using the nas a nationally representative national health interview survey data in the United States. and. Although it's cross-sectional, the survey data does have self-reported occupational physical activity as well as cardiovascular disease in almost 17,000 participants. And this, provide, this table provides a quick snapshot of the results in that analysis where we looked at the odds of cardiovascular disease across levels of self-reported occupational physical activity. And similar to the results in the rest of the world and those you already have seen, it does appear that U.S. workers who perform physical activity during all of their workday have about two times higher odds of having cardiovascular disease than those who never do physical activity at work. 
We also found that the associations were actually exaggerated after we restricted the sample to just never smokers, which suggests that the associations are robust against criticisms of residual confounding by smoking. And um, importantly, lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about today, which is really um, why do these associations exist? Um, and we really want to know this because um, intuitively, we would think that all physical activity would have the same health impact on the human body, right? Why would occupational physical activity be any different? Um, so to frame this talk, I want to anchor you all or introduce you to um, a paper by Dr. Andreas Holterman and his group, including Dr. Krauss, who just spoke. Uh, they published a great commentary in 2018 that outlined six potential mechanisms to explain the physical activity health paradox. And um, before I go through this, I want to just say thank you to Dr. Krauss and his colleagues for a clear explanation, which has served as a, a framework for much of the work that I've done in this space over the past five years. So I appreciate this, this um, paper in particular. And briefly, I just want to go over this. So they, they propose that because occupational physical activity is generally of low intensity and long duration, it's unlikely to confer the beneficial effects of to cardiorespiratory fitness that we see in leisure time physical activity, which is generally more intense and in shorter durations. Um, and related to that point, that long duration continuous activity that we see in occupational activity is likely to increase 24 hour heart rate as well as 24 hour blood pressure, which we know cause or can cause adverse cardiovascular changes over time um, and potentially lead to these associations we're talking about. And then next in the second row, you can see occupational physical activity is performed without sufficient recovery time. Um, we've known for a long time that this is the true power of leisure time physical activity on health comes from recovery and associated adaptations from the bouts of exercise rather than the exercise itself. Um, but in occupational activity, workers might not get the meaningful breaks or rest days that they need. Um, when they're fatigued and therefore might miss the benefits of activity, the activity that they're doing. And then psychological stress during work from higher worker demand and low control could exaggerate some of the cardiovascular strain that we're talking about already. And lastly, all of these things combined could um, lead to high amounts of inflammation related to the occupational activity that they're performing, which is known again to cause poor cardiovascular health downstream. So um, I've been using, using this visual to help myself and others conceptualize the cardiovascular burden piece of the mechanistic pathways I just described. So uh, this figure shows 24-hour cardiovascular strain in general, um, such as heart rate or blood pressure on the y-axis with both up and down indicating increased strain. And the top panel is occupational activity, bottom is leisure time physical activity. It's just a pattern that you'd expect maybe throughout the day. On the bottom, you can see leisure time physical activity on the leisure time physical activity day. There's a short but severe increase in cardiovascular strain from a bout of exercise in the afternoon, right? This person in particular is going cycling. And this bout is followed by a compensatory drop in cardiovascular strain. And as a result, what we know is that the 24 hour cardiovascular load on a day like this would actually be lower than if they were to do no physical activity at all. Um, and that's, we know, to, we know that to be a beneficial cardiovascular adaptation and beneficial for the cardiovascular system overall, because it's a lower cardiovascular strain throughout the 24 hour day. In contrast, though, when we examine the top part of the figure with occupational activity, you can see that there's a moderate but more consistent strain throughout the day from the occupational activity spread throughout maybe a whole work shift, eight, 10 hours throughout the day. And there's importantly no hypotensive response after that activity because it's not intense enough and it's kind of it's so prolonged. So as a result of this type of activity pattern, um, you would get a higher cardiovascular strain throughout the day, the whole 24-hour period, um, than if no activity was performed. And this is this could have negative downstream implications on cardiovascular health, similar to what we would be expect to see in someone with hypertension or high resting heart rate from poor fitness. So we explored these pro 
proposed mechanisms in a couple different studies. First off, um, we performed a small pilot study in nine male workers who reported high amounts of occupational activity. We objectively measured their work and non-work physical activity levels every day for seven days with accelerometers on the lower body. And then we also continuously measured their 24-hour heart rate, blood pressure, and heart rate variability throughout that week. And just really quickly, um, these results were in support of the cardiovascular load mechanisms that I just outlined. Um, in general, we found that workers had high 24-hour heart rate and blood pressure on work days, or higher 24-hour heart rate and blood pressure on work days compared to non-work days. And this is important because we know that higher 24-hour heart rate and blood pressure known to be associated, associated with long-term poor cardiovascular health effects. And we also looked at the um, insufficient recovery time piece of this using heart rate variability. In particular, we looked at um, standard deviation normal to normal intervals or SDNN during the nocturnal period while people are sleeping. And really, this is a measure of parasympathetic activity. And generally, we want higher parasympathetic activity at night, which indicates lower stress and greater rest. And on this figure, SDNN is on the y-axis with daily moderate to vigorous physical activity on the x-axis. And then we stratify the analysis by work and non-work. Work is in work days are in yellow and um, or sorry, non-work days are in yellow and then work days are in blue. So um, you can see looking at the yellow line, uh, as someone does more physical activity on a non-work day, they have higher um, SDNN or parasympathetic activity during sleep, which is a beneficial response and something we would expect. And but on not on work days, you can see where you do more physical activity during the work day, it's actually lower parasympathetic activity during sleep, which might indicate that the physical and psychological stress of the high work day or the high activity during work um, carries forward even into the subsequent night sleep and therefore uh, indicates stress carrying forward. Next, I want to talk about kind of daily stress levels related to work. So we examine stress levels from the worker as self, via self-reported stress scale. Um, and these two figures display uh, physical activity at work on the y-axis with light activity on the left and then moderate to vigorous physical activity on the right. Work stress scores on the x-axis where higher number indicates more stress and the darker blue in the figure indicates higher 24-hour cardiovascular load as measured by rate pressure product. And really this is indicating a uh, interaction effect by work stress where in general you can see people with low activity and low stress have the lowest cardiovascular strain but people with high activity and high stress have the highest cardiovascular strain. And it demonstrates that work stress may have a role in exaggerating some of the cardiovascular load from the activity we've just described. Um, and then we looked at the same mechanisms or you know, similar mechanisms in the CARDIA cohort study, which is a 35 year uh, longitudinal study, including 10 exams. At every exam, they self-report their leisure time, physical activity and occupational physical activity. And then at year seven and 20, they had a treadmill fitness test and at years five and 30, they had a clinical echocardiogram. So we performed two studies with this data. Um, first, the first study examined associations of occupational activity with 13 year changes in fitness from years seven to 20. That's that, those yellow indicators on this figure. And then the second study examined 25 year changes in clinical echocardiogram outcomes, uh, which is the red figure or red icons in this figure. The results of the first study are displayed here. Uh, we're, we're looking at 13-year trajectories of leisure time physical activity or occupational physical activity on the y-axis and then um, beta coefficients for fitness at 13-year follow-up on the x-axis. And as expected, you can see that higher 13-year leisure time physical activity, so that more physical activity they each individual did across those 13 years of follow-up, we saw higher fitness levels, which is expected and seen in the literature. But we also saw the opposite in occupational physical activity, which is confir which confirms or supports the hypotheses we proposed earlier around fitness that occupational physical activity might not be actually um, 
improving fitness so, um, as we're seeing with leisure time physical activity. And then we looked at echocardiogram outcomes in the same study because really we're hypothesizing that higher, cardi the higher cardiovascular strain that those people experience during um, high occupational physical activity would result in changes in or adverse changes in cardiovascular structure and function down, down the line. And on the left, you can see that we made three trajectories of occupational physical activity across the 25 year study period, where we have people with no activity, people with medium activity, and people with high occupational activity throughout that 25 year period. And then we observed significantly higher end systolic volume and lower ejection fraction in people with high compared to no occupational activity. Um, and the other outcomes of left ventricular mask mass and diastolic volume, stroke volume, EA wave ratio were non-significant, but they were all in the hypothesized direction. So in general, the results um, provide some more specific support to the notion that high amounts of occupational physical activity and the associated strain over time, um, specifically over these 25-year follow-up, can potentially cause downstream effects on cardiovascular structure and function that could lead to some of the outcomes that we've talked about, cardiovascular disease and, and mortality later on. So I get this question a lot, does the par paradox actually exist, especially because I'm a physical activity person? Um, I think that we have enough epidemiological and mechanistic evidence at this point to say maybe, or even probably, I think at this point. Uh, importantly, though, we need to keep studying it. Um, it's really something that we are at the early stage of studying the mechanisms and, and pathways by which these exist, so we really need to keep diving into it. Um, but why should we continue to care about the work? I really want to anchor us to the, the reason why we should continue this. Um, so if the paradox is true, the way we currently think about and recommend physical activity around the world doesn't adequately consider those people who have high, high amounts of occupational activity. In other words, because those who, um, those who achieve our physical activity recommendations primarily through occupational activity may not be actually getting the benefits that they think they're getting or that we're promising them through the recommendations. And importantly, those people are often part of racial or ethnic minority groups who are already at increased risk for poor health. And additionally, our current occupational safety and health guidelines, which largely focus on musculoskeletal impacts of occupational activity, may be missing the mark um, in considering important cardiovascular health implications as well. So um, lastly, before we go, I just want to mentioned that before we can change these recommendations and guidelines and, you know, the big picture pie in the sky kind of recommendations here, we really need better studies of the associations and mechanisms that we're talking about today um, so we can understand when and how we can intervene for the benefit of these workers. So we really need better study designs with better comparison groups um, to limit the impact of potential for residual confounding, um, and we really need to get creative in this front because it is a very difficult um, population to study. We also need to know if the impacts, if there are differential impacts across different types of occupational activity. For example, if there's different health impacts of continuous lower versus upper body tasks on cardiovascular strain or cardiovascular health, we could modulate between those two tasks or change the task structure to maybe intervene on the tasks um, and provide some, some health impact. And then lastly, we really need better surveillance of occupational activity on a whole, particularly in, in the United States, to examine the impacts and mechanis mechanisms of action in larger samples, because it's really lacking at this point. And with that, I just want to thank you all for your time and welcoming me here. I'm happy to answer any questions during the Q&A or at the end. Um, at the end or in the chat. So um, thank you and have a great day. First, I would like to thank for the opportunity to present our result here. My talk will be focused on a very special population, which are pregnant women. So I'm interested in this population is because their exposures and health conditions are not only important for themselves, 
but also very critical for their babies. In addition, emerging evidence has also suggested that pregnancy is a metabolic challenge for women, and those individuals may present potential CVD risk and show an early sign during this special stage. So as mentioned in the previous presentation, we know we have multiple organizations develop the recommendations or guidelines for physical activity in general population. And those guidelines also include the information for pregnant women. For example, the US HHS and the WHO guidelines also recommend uh, uh, you know, the regular physical activity are beneficial for pregnant individuals. In addition, we have also have an American College of uh, an obstetrician and gynecologist uh, ACOG make a, a special recommendations for physical activity for pregnant individual. So as you can see in this graph here, they are very consistent uh, uh, among all those recommendations. They recommend uh, physical activity for pregnant individual as similar for other adults. Um, however, as we mentioned uh, before, those recommendations do not differentiate the leisure time physical activity and occupational physical activity. And there's no specific information for the occupational physical activity. So why we want to understand the more about the health benefit of the all the risk of occupational physical activity among pregnant individuals? So first, we should acknowledge that uh, pregnant individuals are also working populations. In the U.S., most of pregnant women are still employed during the pregnancy. For example, about 56 of them still working full time during pregnancy, and among them, 82 are continue to work within the months before their due dates. And also, occupational physical activity is a major component of total physical activity among the pregnant women who are still working. For many years, concerns have been expressed that physical activity during work may expose pregnant individuals to higher risk of certain adverse pregnant outcomes. And so some particular occupational physical activity has been a um, concern, including lifting, heavy loading, and the long time standing. For example, a recent meta-analysis and a systematic review conducted in 20, 2020 has reported the result from 80 studies. And they found, you know, lifting, Standing longer time here, more than four hours per day, and having a heavy physical workload increase the odds of preterm birth by up to 31%. And in addition, lifting 11 kilograms per time increased the odds of miscarriage by 35%. And however, most previous studies have only focusing on the limited outcomes such as preterm birth, low birth weight, or miscarriage. This limited study look at the cardiometabolic health among the pregnant individuals. So even the ACOR has indicated more research is needed to improve our understanding and pro provide more scientific evidence concerning effect of occupational physical activity on the maternal and fetal health. So a couple of studies in the European has indicated there is a negative association uh, of the leisure time physical activity with cardiometabolic health during the pregnancy. However, the research regarding the occupational physical activity is still lacking. So we hypothesis that, that physical activity paradox may also hold for pregnant individuals. So we are very interested to address a research question on uh, whether physical activity and uh, its relationship with cardiometabolic health among pregnant women and, and the, the form is matters. So whether the physical activity occurring during the later time or is during the 
working time, they have a different health effect. So in particular, we're interested to address a malpractice individual examining the association of occupational physical activity and the laser time physical activity with cardiometabolic health. We would like to examine their association independently and jointly. Particularly, the joint association will be very important to address. For the walking pregnant women, is the recommendation of high leisure time physical activity will still be beneficial. And also because uh, during the pregnancy, there is a dramatic change, the, the domestic change regarding to the metabolic response to physical activity. So we would also like to examine the association both in specific time period and across the pregnancy. In addition, we also would like to examine the association of different type of physical activity uh, with the cardiac metabolic health. Uh, the drive those research uh, aims, we selected a very unique study of the uh, pregnant population in the US. So this is the NICHD fetal growth study, the singlet cohort. So this cohort is uh, recruited pregnant individuals from 12 US clinical site. Overall, it's included uh, 2,800 uh, individuals from uh, four racial ethnic groups, including non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, Hispanics, and uh, uh, Asian and others. So the study was uh, recruited between the 2009 and the 2013. So this study is unique because number one, it has longitudinal data collections, uh, most uh, more than four times across the pregnancy. It collected uh, uh, blood samples, uh, lifestyle factors such as diet, physical activity, uh, as well as clinical outcomes and the fetal growth. So for this particular study, we selected uh, a sample, a subsample from the, the fetal growth cohort is a nested case control GBM biomarker studies, so which include uh, uh, 321 women who have their blood sample already, uh, biomarker already being examined. So as you can see in this graph, so showing the blood sample of pregnant individuals has been collected four times uh, across the, uh, and meanwhile, the physical activity has been also collected uh, in the first trimester, second trimester, and the third trimester. More specifically, uh, the measure of physical activity in the previous year has been collected uh, uh, during the eight to 13 gestational weeks for the first trimesters. And uh, for the second and third trimesters, the physical activity since the last visit has been measured. So I just wanted to briefly mention how we measure physical activity in the fetal growth study. So we use, it's called the Pregnancy Physical Activity Questionnaire. So this questionnaire asks for 34 questions on different type of physical activity. So they can be divided by four domains. Number one, household and caregiving. Number two, transportation. Number three, occupational physical activity. And number four, sports and exercise. So this is considered as leisure time physical activity. So for each question, it directly asks the duration of each type of physical activity. And then each physical activity is classified by the intensity. So they can be classified as sedentary, light, moderate, or rigorous. So the metabolic equivalent MET hours per week is a measure of energy expenditure for each or total physical activity can be calculated by the duration of the physical activity times its intensity. So I just want to show you, so for leisure time physical activity, we have nine questions specifically asking different types. And for the occupational physical activity, we have five questions asking sitting at work or class, and 
Ending all slowly working at work while carrying things. Slowly and uh, standing at work, not carrying things. Working quickly at work, carrying things, and work quickly at work, not carrying anything. So, so based on those measurements, uh, we actually calculate the metabolic equivalence uh, for either leisure time physical activity and occupational physical activity. So for the primary analysis, we categorize uh, the, those activities uh, uh, by high versus low according to the median value um, at a specific time point. Uh, however, in the sensitivity analysis, we also examine association of the continuous physical activity uh, with outcomes. So in addition, we also examine the change of leisure time or occupational physical activity uh, from the first trimester to second trimester and from second trimester to third trimester in association with the outcomes. Uh, so for the specific time of occupational physical activity, we actually examine at each trimester how um, each type of physical activity if performed uh, equal or greater than two hours versus less than two hours. Uh, as you can see, this pie chart here showing among the total physical activity, uh, occupational physical activity is actually the dominant uh, domain respons responding for more than 30, 40, 43.5% of the total physical activity. Uh, and the leisure time physical activity only uh, represents 4.3% uh, of total physical activity. And for the cardiovascular outcomes, we selected a particular biomarker. It's called the high sensitivity C creative protein. So this is a well, a well recognized biomarker uh, for chronic inflammation. It's also the most consistent and strong predictors for cardiovascular disease risk and cardiovascular mortality in general population and in individual uh, pregnant individuals. So we examine the time specific association of leisure time and the uh, occupational physical activity with the uh, CRP using a, a weighted linear regression model with robust variance estimate. And those result was actually adjusted for the potential confounders listed here. And also I want to mention the occupational physical activity and the leisure time physical activity were mutually adjusted uh, with each exposures. So let's look first look at uh, the leisure time physical activity um, on the bottom, on the top of this table. So as you can see in the first trimester, so um, pregnant women who are classified as having higher leisure time physical activity have the similar level of HSCRP as compared to the women who have lower level of physical uh, leisure time physical activity. So suggesting there's no association during the fourth trimester. However, in the second and third trimester, um, women with high leisure time physical activity have significantly lower level of CRP as compared to women with low leisure time physical activity, suggesting there is an inverse association uh, between CRP and uh, leisure time physical activity. Now let's look at to the occupational physical activity on the bottom. So um, very interestingly, in the first trimester, uh, we observe the women with high occupational physical activity have a higher level of CRP compared to women with low occupational physical activity. And so, so suggesting there is a positive association between occupational physical activity and CRP. Um, and there actually no association has been observed for the occupational physical activity and CRP during the second and the third trimester. So we also look at uh, the joint association of uh, occupational physical activity and leisure and physical activity in association with CRP um, at each trimester. So I will walk you through um, those graphs. So if we look at uh, the, the left, which is graph A, showing the result from the uh, first trimester. And um, as you can see, um, 
among the group three and four who with higher level of occupational activity, regardless of their leisure life, leisure time physical activity, the CRP level was higher compared to uh, the other two groups. But during the second trimester, which is showing in the graph B, and this has been changed. So if you look at uh, the first and the third groups, are those having higher level of leisure time physical activity, it seems like no matter their occupational physical activity level uh, is either high or low, their uh, CRP level are relatively lower than the other two groups. Although those results are not statistically significant uh, by the level of 0 0.05, but uh, the point estimator is very interesting. So if we move to the graph C, which is showing the uh, result for the third trimester, which is uh, you know very close to the delivery. Uh, so the groups uh, in the right circle is the one who have a higher occupational physical activity and a lower leisure time physical activity. So this group, as you can see, have the highest level of CRP compared to the other three groups. And if you look at the green circle, so suggesting either your lower occupational physical activity or increased leisure time physical activity during the third trimester may lower level of CRP compared to you know the group uh, indicated in the right circle. And with regard to the association of changes in occupational physical activity and the leisure time physical activity with the CRP across the pregnancy, uh, as you can show, during the first from the first to second trimester, there is an association for either occupational physical activity or leisure time physical activity. However, an increase in occupational physical activity from the second to third trimester is associated with a higher level of CRP during the third trimester. On contrast, increased leisure time physical activity from the second to third trimester is associated with lower level of CRP during the third trimester. So again, a positive association for the occupational physical activity and the inverse association of leisure time physical activity. And with regarding to the different type of occupational physical activity, we also examine them by uh, each trimester. So as you can see during the first trimester, and so if we compare any type of occupational physical activity, which uh, performed uh, greater or longer than two hours versus less than two hours, and there's no difference between the seating. However, and standing or walking not carrying things, standing or walking carrying things, walking fast not carrying things, and walking fast carrying things, all associated with a higher level of CRP. And, and there's no association with any type of occupational physical activity with CRP during the second and third trimester. So this result is consistent for the overall uh, association of occupational physical activity only observed during the first trimesters. So in summary, and our results suggested uh, uh, both occupational physical activity and the leisure time physical activity were independently and jointly associated with uh, a biomarker of cardiovascular health in pregnant individuals, so that is CRP. And our results also support our hypothesis, the association of the occupational physical activity and the leisure time physical activity and in a diff different directions and the association attempts back across the pregnancy. So in particular, occupational physical activity during the preconceptional and early pregnancy uh, was positively associated with CRP in early pregnancy. On the other hand, leisure time physical activity is inversely associated with CRP in middle to late pregnancy. And we also, our result also suggests that higher leisure time physical activity could offer sight uh, the occupational physical 
activities negative impact on CRP in the mid to late pregnancy. Uh, additionally, increased phys physical activity, occupational physical activity from middle to late pregnancy may increase the CRP levels. And regarding to the particular type of standing and walking, so um, standing and walking or fast walking, regardless of carrying things, may be a concern for the phys occupational physical activity. And at this time, I would also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge and thank for the SHD fetal growth study participant. And uh, the fetal growth study was supported by the SHD intramural funding and also included some funding from the ARA. And, and myself was supported by the SHD R1 grant. And my students, uh, PhD students, Xinyue, who, who conducted uh, the uh, statistic analysis was supported by the CDC, uh, you know, Southern California, Nashi Education and Research Center at UCLA pilot research uh, uh, project training grant. And I also would like to uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborator, Dr. Chi Lin Zhang, who is the PI of the fetal growth study, uh, GDM case control biomarkers, and uh, will uh, you know, share with us of the data and, uh, and uh, strongly support our um, research for this project. Uh, in addition, Dr. Jian Li and Dr. Andrews Altman has provided critical, you know, uh, feedbacks uh, regarding to the study design, the result, and the interpretation. So thank you for uh, your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thanks. <clears throat> and welcome back to the live portion. This is Jeff Whitfield again, um, and we have some excellent questions and uh, questions coming into the Q&A box. So at this time, I'll invite the uh, speakers to um, come off of mute and start the cameras, and, and we can run through some of these questions. <clears throat> and a few of them have already been answered in the uh, Q&A box, and those should be, uh, once a question is answered, uh, all participants should be able to see the question and the answer. So again, as, you, as we continue, please, uh, please do continue to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to them as, as best we can. So we've got some key takeaways up on the screen right now, just in case you need a refresher of what was presented early in the um, in the recording. And then I'll start off with our first Q&A. So um, uh, David asks, uh, how do you explain the sex differences in health outcomes between males and females? And I think some of this, Dr. Krauss, you might have mentioned was uh, potentially uh, linked to differences in assessments, but I wondered if you had any additional thoughts there. Yeah, I would like to refer to uh, the great work of uh, Canadian researcher Perrin Messing, who has looked at this question in much details in many uh, occupational groups and has found that uh, the actually physical demands um, are different, even in the same job for men and women often. And um, just to give you an, um, an, an example from my own experience, when I teach about this, my graduate students who are occupational health nurses, I ask them at your board, do, do you have a lift team? People who help you lift heavy patients, and can you call them in? And the biggest guy, the biggest nurse in class said, I'm the lift team. The biggest people at work, the men, get usually asked to do the heaviest jobs. That's in our culture, this is polite. And also people think who's big is strong. So there are shifts in terms of who does the heaviest work even within the job that is often gender uh, driven and by perceptions. And um, that is one thing. The other thing is in which jobs uh, people tend to migrate or migrate out. Uh, there's gender domination in certain jobs. So we need to look actually at uh, better and more detailed measures of the cardiovascular load that people experience while working. It's difficult to describe all these job details in big epidemiological studies or in any study. We need to actually use a kind of a biological marker. What's the cardiovascular strain? And we have the tools. We know it's heart rate mostly and blood pressure, which is the strain on the cardiovascular system. So we can measure both. It takes account of differences in sex, in fitness, in everything, in clothing, in heat. We can use that. That would be 
then we will have better studies. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that we cannot in an individual workplace uh, figure these things out, but overall that will be difficult in broad epidemiological studies. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. And we have quite a few questions to get through. So in the interest of time, I would like to move us on, but uh, very quickly, Dr. Chen or Dr. Quinn, any additional comments on these uh, sex differences? Not for me. That, that was great, Dr. Krauss. Thanks. Yeah, we only look at, uh, you know, um, pregnant women. So yeah, we don't have any new evidence to suggest uh, uh, any, you know, um, regarding the, the gender difference or sex difference. Let me add one physiological thing, which is uh, which we all should be aware of. Um, menstruating women usually have a lower hemoglobin, so that reduces their cardiovascular capacity. They cannot transport as much oxygen to the organs with the same amount of heartbeats than their men can do because their blood does not transport as much oxygen. So they have to have a higher heart rate for the same external work, even if they are, have the same muscles and everything. So it is actually there at a disadvantage and we should actually see if the work is the same, a slightly higher risk among women than in, in among men. That would be the expectation based on physiology. Thank you. All right, next up. Um, Ken asks, uh, I'm also curious about the state of the science regarding occupational physical activities relationship with other chronic health outcomes. Are there multiple paradoxes? And I'll leave that open to the uh, speakers to choose who goes first. Dr. Krauss, you might be the best person to answer this as well. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it to you if, if you want. I, I'm not aware of uh, literature too much outside of cardiovascular health outcomes. So. Um, I would uh, like to leave it at cardiovascular disease for today. Let's answer these questions because this is a new field. This is too much to cover in one session, I think. Yeah, I, I just would like to add a little bit, you know, uh, points, at least for a private individual. I mean, a certain type of occupational physical activity has been associated with other outcomes. For example, the preterm birth, miscarriage. So it's likely, but yeah, we definitely uh, out of scope of this webinar. Yeah, and also it's it's probably worth noting that the focus on cardiovascular disease outcomes can partially be driven by the longitudinal study design. So it is the most common cause of death in developed countries, and so you will uh, you will accrue the most cardiovascular deaths early and be able to report them first. So um, uh, potentially another consideration there. All right. Next up, um, Bill Boyer asks, what are the panelists' thoughts on needs for future population surveillance of occupational physical activity? Further, what can be done with the current surveillance data to address gaps in the 2018 physical activity guidelines so that they may be con considered for future guidelines? So um, I, I don't know if Bill wants to hear my opinion on this again, but thanks for the question, Bill. Um, I, I think the, the surveillance as it stands now, you know, we rely a lot on, um, on subjective measures of physical activity. And oftentimes those, those questionnaires have information about domain. So we understand in, in some of the larger surveillance studies, what population levels of leisure time as well as occupational and transportation and so on and so forth physical activity is. But, but really what we um, end up reporting and leaning on as far as the you know, surveillance goes is just leisure time physical activity because some of the subjective measures that we have in, in surveillance of the other types of physical activity aren't as reliable because it's hard to remember how much activity you do and that sort of thing. Um, surveillance is kind of moving forward into the objective understanding or towards um, prioritizing objective measurements of physical activity, which unfortunately takes out the domain, right? So we're leaving, we're, we're starting to use accelerometers and that sort of thing to measure physical activity on population levels. And um, while that's really great because it takes some of the subjectivity and bias out of the physical activity measurement, um, it also reduces our ability to determine or differentiate between the different domains in activity. 
So I think we're we're at a crossroads where we're we're starting to see more of the objective monitors. It might make sense in the future to use both subjective measurements to understand domain as well as the objective monitoring on population level, or maybe even start to ask um, or include time use diaries as well with the uh, objective measurements to understand the, the domain of the physical activities being performed with the objective monitors. But it, it's a tough question on a population level because it's really hard to, to measure. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the issue is over um, emphasized self report versus objective measures. Um, the self report is good enough to rank people. It is actually very um, uh, useful if it is, if we stay actually with the self report, like I'm lifting so much or so often, or I'm standing so long, because that already gives us what we need to do in terms of intervention. Instead, using counts of movements in an accelerometer doesn't give us any idea what to do. So I think the self-report measures are actually pretty, pretty well suited for surveillance and should be continued to be used. We can do better. We can ask more questions as we, ha as we have done with other things. In addition, I think for research, um, it is actually important to use measures that take care of not just the physical activity, but of heat and other things that are present at the workplace or holding tools. We never get this with uh, accelerometers. And this is static work, holding a tool. And this, um, these things are happening all over, but it gets lost with these sensors right now. We don't have uh, sensors that take this into effect, unless you think about heart rate. That might be the way to do it. Great, thank you. All right, this next question, I think, uh, is gearing is steering us in a direction that I, I think we're seeing some themes on in, in some of the questions, and that is, um, uh, it's 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 hinting at this idea that there have in in some sectors and some types of workers there has been a push to avoid sitting. So we're seeing the proliferation of standing desks and avoidance of sitting is a good thing. Um, and so our, our next question uh, says, given the results regarding higher occupational physical activity and poor cardiovascular health, can you discuss the implications for the significant increase in, in uh, significant increase in research examining impacts on getting workers to have less sedentary behavior, e.g. sit to stand work desks? So anyone care to, to lead us off in this in this discussion? Sure. I mean, it has been the, the bigger part of my presentation than I thought it would be. But when I read um, the guidelines, actually the scientific basics of the report of the scientists who um, gave the report to the De Department of Human Health and um, Services, there was this notion that you know standing sitting is the same we can put it into one group and i was shocked that this was recommended because we see that there's totally different risks between sitting and standing and it's also physiological very different but not from the perspective if, if you think obesity research it doesn't make much difference and that's i think where people are coming from or from accelerometry which one accelerometer cannot differentiate between sitting and standing. You have to have at least two and use a complicated algorithm to do that. So that's we basically the researchers who are come from that field say, okay, we cannot study this. Or for us, it's the same because in terms of kilocalories, it doesn't differ so much because the heart's work in standing is much more at the heart level than the musculoskeletal level. So anyway, that is uh, probably the history of this. And um, when we uh, think about, oh, now I lost my, I lost the question again. <laughs> Sorry for that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to offer a refresher. So it's it's this idea of um, uh, how do we reconcile what we've heard today with the um, oh. with the with the recommendations for sedentary office workers, for example, to stand more throughout. Yeah. 
Good. I think it is wonderful to have adjustable workplaces for everybody, whether in the office or in industry. That's what we need. That's an ergonomic principle. You have to adjust the workplace and workers have to be able to freely choose the best posture. As we say in ergonomics, the best posture is the next posture. So you want to have freedom of movement and freedom of change. That is good. Now, how much does it do in terms of preventing heart disease? Uh, Dr. Rample and I read a, uh, an editorial about that. You can find it online, whether um, sit-stand sit -stand desks will actually reduce cardiovascular disease mortality or incidence. We came to the conclusion, no, for several reasons in there. But um, it is also obvious from what I showed today. When you looked at this long slide that has been on purpose long on the screen with the three bars sitting on the left, standing in the middle high, and then required sitting, standing, and walking on the right was 4% less than sitting. So your intervention potential, if you get there, that people actually have a mixture, you maybe get a 4% reduction. I'm not talking about statistics, here, just seeing the effects there. This is nothing compared to what you get if you give people a chair. You reduce it by 100% right there. And that is, you know, this is sort of why I say it's the elephant in the room. We have been focusing on office workers, on people who have already the lowest risk in, in cardiovascular disease mortality, instead of focusing on the high-risk people and using the low-hanging fruit, giving people a chair. Look at cashiers. In Europe, no cashier has to stand. In America, everybody has to stand. A bank teller has to stand. That's not necessary. So it's very easy, very cheap. Let's focus on that and stop bothering too much the office people with interrupting their seating. They can do this. They have the freedom already. They are well off and better off than the others. Great, thank you. All right, next up, I'm gonna paraphrase this next one a little bit, but it, um, it has to do with, th this next question has to do with some parallels or differences in, in the phenomena that we're seeing uh, in the presentations today and uh, some extreme endurance athletes. So um, I wonder if any of you care to comment on the similarity, similarities or differences in the occupational physical activity paradox and something like uh, chronic overtraining um, in, uh, in, in extreme uh, physical activity cases. Yeah, I can comment on, on that a little bit. Um, I will say that there, of course, is some literature out there looking at, at overtraining syndrome and um, professional athletes and um, individuals who perform high, high amounts of physical activity um, in their leisure time. And that literature, of course, is related to what we're talking about here. There's there's a similarity in that you're doing high amounts of activity over a long period of time, um, and it comes down to the lack of recovery in those people, right? They're not recovering enough to actually experience the benefits of the exercise or um, to have the adaptations over time, right? Um, but one important piece that is different when we talk about occupational physical activity, and I presented a little bit of this in my presentation, is that in occupational physical activity, we're typically not experiencing the same fitness benefits, or we're not expecting to see the same fitness benefits as someone that's doing high amounts of leisure time physical activity. Like someone that runs a lot, of course, has high amounts of um, activity, but they're also getting, it's also of high intensity and they're getting the fitness benefits that, that maybe over time they can adapt to the exercise that they're performing. So we do see some parallels and the total volume is potentially detrimental to cardiovascular health, but the way we get there is a little bit different in that leisure time physical activity oftentimes is higher intensity and um, increases fitness, whereas in occupational physical activity, we don't have those benefits oftentimes and uh, we don't have recovery. And um, also in occupational activity, we also have um, lack of autonomy to change what we're doing or take a rest day. Um, and that sort of thing. So there are certainly there are certainly parallels, but they're not exactly the same thing. Great, thank you. And with the la last couple of minutes that we have, we do have a question specific for Dr. Chen, and this is from Sylvia. So uh, for Dr. Chen, do you do you think that uh, semester? Excuse me. Let me start over. 
Uh, do you think trimester specific results are driven by reductions in occupational physical activity as pregnancy progresses? Yeah, this is a, a very good question because we do have part, uh, data to examine the change of occupational physical activity and the leisure time of physical activity during the pregnancy was actually very slight. So based on our time spent analysis and the change analysis, uh, I, I don't think, I mean, the reduce uh, for occupational physical activity or leisure time physical activity could be a major reason. So I do believe there's a, a association reflect, uh, I mean, the, the measure at a specific time uh, when we use the change, it's actually the model suggests the increase of the occupational physical activity from the, the, the second to third is associated with higher CFG now. And with that, we're coming right up against 2.30 and I know that um, uh, we have some other commitments. So I I'd like to pass this back to Todd for uh, closing. Thank you, uh, Jeff, and all the panelists. I really appreciate uh, your time today. Uh, real quick, uh, for those of you that uh, want to see some of the literature that uh, our speakers have been a part of and uh, helped publish or are the primary auth authors on some papers, uh, you can see those here, both for Dr. Krauss, Dr. Quinn, and sorry, uh, <laughs> Dr. Chen. Uh, and if, if you don't have time to write all this down, this will be posted on CDC YouTube here in about a month or so. So please look for that posting. Uh, you can rewatch all of this in its entirety. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all uh, today, our speakers for joining us. I'd like to thank our audience for posting some really great questions. Uh, if your question was not uh, answered, uh, please feel free to reach out to us at the email there, crcprogram at cdc.gov. Uh, we will make every attempt to get those questions answered and back to you. I believe you had to enter your email uh, when you registered. Uh, so uh, please feel free to contact us if you want to follow up uh, with any of our speakers or the CRC program. And I thank you for your attention. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.